Okay, so yes, this this morning I want to speak about local currencies, and the the title of my uh, of my presentation is that local currencies have the ability to be uh, an underappreciated tool, underappreciated tool for local value creation, uh, community coherency, and a strategy for keeping wealth in place. And and I guess as a as an opening anecdote, I live in El Salvador where. Uh, we have about 6 million uh, residents that live in the country here. We're a very small country. But there's an additional 3 million uh, migrants, uh, Salvadorans, who live mostly in North America, in the United States, and Canada. Uh, so the remittances that uh, local families uh, send back is one of the main drivers of uh, uh, of, of GDP, of, of, of local economies. But uh, a couple of years ago, we did a study here uh, in El Salvador about what happens to those billions and billions of dollars that get sent back uh, from the United States and Canada into local communities. And one of the things that we found is that about 85 percent of the money that people sent back uh, from the United States to to uh, local communities here in El Salvador uh, eventually got sucked away from the community uh, one value chain afterwards. So the vast majority of people received their money, went to the bank. And they immediately spent that money on resources, uh, on things uh, that were not produced in the community, uh, and essentially sucking that wealth back away from the community. And so we started to think, what if there is a way that communities could say, look, all of this money that's coming into our community, we could find ways to maintain that in our community, to circulate it uh, longer and longer around um you know, the places where, where we live. So instead of, you know, going into the city and going to the supermarket and buying from Walmart, which is one of the main supermarket chains here in El Salvador, what if we, uh, you know, uh, encouraged people to, to purchase from local uh, farmers, local vendors in the local market, uh, instead of purchasing cement that that is imported from from a different country, what if we, uh, you know, found ways to to have people invest with natural building techniques? Uh, people who who there's a small uh, young kind of like a, a cooperative of 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 young people who are building natural homes from adobe uh, and other natural building techniques. And the idea was that the more that people can keep wealth in local communities. You know, obviously, the the more benefit we're going to receive in, in this case from remittances, from from money that's sent from abroad from migrants, um, and then one of the things that we also found was that local currencies, uh, by avoiding the temptation to always change money here in El Salvador, we we use the U.S. dollar, um, but you know that 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 is also a way of of extracting money from the community. So local currencies, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, um, is that is a strategy for specifically keeping money in place. So local currencies are, you know, a type of money, a, a medium of exchange that is generally only accepted in a small restricted geographical area. So when communities decide to use their local currencies, it, it's almost it's a it's a way to oblige that money to stay in place. Whereas if you have a national currency like the US dollar that we use, you know, people can obviously use that and purchase anywhere and According to you know our the the globalized capitalist economy in which we live, there is a you know this overriding tendency for money to escape from the community, right? For money to be siphoned off, to go through a funnel and eventually leave that community. So local currencies are a strategy to kind of oblige people, force people to keep the value, to keep the the money that they have within their communities. I'm going to speak real quick uh, about the outline. So before we talk about what local currencies are, I want to talk fairly quickly about some of the risks um, uh, that exist uh, with relying on national currencies. So again, you know, uh, every most countries in the world have national currencies here in, in Latin America. There are several communities that uh, have begun to adopt uh, the U.S. dollar as kind of the national currencies like wh where we live. But um, one of the things I want to speak is that local currencies also act as a safety valve, as a mechanism uh, to not only keep value in community, but also to protect against some of the risks of inflation, uh, which is obviously a major issue around the world today, especially after the, the COVID-19 or since the COVID-19 uh, uh, issue that, uh, you know, caused massive amounts of inflation. Uh, so we're going to talk a, a little bit about, about how inflation 
uh, inflationary monetary policies have been one of the reasons that societies have collapsed over years. And we're going to talk about the case of Rome, and we're going to try and translate that to to monetary policies that are being forced by governments all around the world, especially a policy known as quantitative easing. Uh, then we're going to speak real quick about what are local currencies. We're going to give a few de definitions and talk about three main examples. And then lastly, we're going to look real quickly about some of the advantages of what I spoke about in the beginning, you know, how local currencies can keep uh, 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 local value, uh, keep wealth in place and create more of a sense of community. Um, so let's talk about first about the, co uh, the cost and the cause of inflation. Uh, there's a book that I would recommend if anybody's interested in the subject uh, by an author named William Offels. Uh, he came out with a book called Immoderate Greatness, which is why civilizations fail. Uh, and he speaks about several different reasons, looking back at history and anthropology about why past civilizations from Rome uh, to the ancient Mayans here in this part of the world to other parts of the world, you know, why these civilizations always tend to fail. Uh, and then obviously he takes those those lessons from history that are repetitive and circular and tries to make, uh, you know, certain uh, correlations to to the world we live in today. Uh, and so one of the one of the things that he says is that inflation is one of the main causes uh, of societal collapse. Um, and here are a few quotes from the book. I'm going to read real quick. It said leaders, uh, you know, leaders of, of civilizations, political leaders, when we're when they're faced with crises, resort to deliberately debasing the currency that is consciously adopting a policy of inflation. Uh, inflation is something uh, that that doesn't just happen, uh, you know, magically. It's 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 something that's that's caused by by governments. Uh, so when governments are trying to maintain certain standards of living that people have uh you know been, become accustomed to but they find that they don't have the physical and social infrastructure to maintain that uh because of ecological breakdown because of fiscal debts uh because of uh you know corruption in governments one of the one of the strategies that governments uh and leaders and states throughout history have always done is related to creating inflation essentially debasing the money that circulates in a in a place uh and by a continuing process of inflation governments confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens uh they confiscate that uh in a way that that creates wealth for some uh, maybe fixes a short-term problem, but over the long term causes a serious threat to the well-being of people. So let's talk about the case of Rome. Uh, in Rome, uh, you know, before the year 64 AD, uh, you might have heard of the word denarii. Uh, it's it's a, it's a word that's mentioned in uh, you know in history and in the Bible, and that was the main coinage uh, that circulated throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, they always used gold and silver uh, initially. Um, you know, it was before. You know, obviously, uh, ancient Rome, their their coins were a true source of value, right? And so, uh, by by minting coins of, of of gold and silver, it was showing that this is a source of value that people could then exchange. Uh, but in the air in the year sixty four A.D., Nero, uh, the emperor of Rome at that time, started to, to discover that they that they simply did not have enough coinage, did not have enough money uh to cover all of the government uh responsibilities all of the ministries that they were involved in uh paying all of the government employees keeping up infrastructure um and so what they did is the emperors found uh, uh this policy or this idea uh of a, of um debasing the community and so uh, the 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 coinage so what they did is they started instead of uh coin or making coins out of 100% silver or 100% gold uh, they started making the coins smaller, uh, and then they also started uh, putting in other other different types of metal, like copper, uh, nickel, other metals that were cheaper um, and, and that weren't as well. So if we look at this graph over here, uh, so starting around 64 uh, AD, the, the, the silver content of a Roman denarius was fairly close to 100%. Uh, and about 250 years later, it was almost down to zero percent. Uh, so that that is a you know an obvious policy of 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 governments trying to deliberately debase, create inflation as a way to to deal with their uh, you know with with their fiscal requirements, with uh, the money that they needed to have. Um, so what happened is that the political elite, the leaders, the oligarchy discovered that. They have all of these expenses, and so what they can do is start to create a whole bunch more coins, uh, start to create coins that have less value, uh, and then they, they they are able to pay for their short-term expenses. Um, but what happens is that people start to find out. People aren't dumb, and they're saying, hey, these coins are smaller, and this one doesn't 
feel quite as heavy as gold or, or as silver. And people started to understand. And then, you know, obviously inflation set in. So, uh, you know, the, the, the local baker suddenly was charging uh, five denarii instead of two denarii for a loaf of bread. Uh, and over 200 years, uh, inflation rose by hundreds and hundreds of percent in, throughout the entire Roman uh, Empire. Uh, so when governments do this, the, the, uh, Rome is just one case study. It's it's something that uh, has happened um, all over the place. It's not something that that just occurred, uh, you know, in the Roman Empire. Every um, uh, civilization had sim similar inflationary policies with the monetary system they used. Uh, and there's a, a one thinker that I would also recommend is Jesus Huerta de Soto. He says the process of monetary inflation gives rise to a redistribution of income in favor of those who receive the new injection or doses of monetary units. So when governments uh, begin inflationary policies, it benefits uh, you know uh, local governments because they they understand what's going on, and the people who are close to government circles understand that they they tend to benefit economically, while the rest of the people uh, who start to discover you know what's happening uh you know they they the, the prices of goods and services go up and the price of this inflation gets uh, pushed on to people and eventually money becomes worthless and once money becomes worthless also government society and standards uh so what does this ancient roman policy have to do uh with modern economic theory uh, especially MMT, modern monetary theory, which is kind of the way, especially since 1970s, the United States government was the first one to withdraw their currency from the gold standard. Uh, that means that before 1970, every U.S. dollar that was in circulation was based on the reserves of gold and silver and other precious metals uh, that the U.S. government had in their uh, in their archives, right? And, you know, stored away. Uh, and eventually they decided we're going we're gonna to take our money off of the gold standard. Uh, so money became nothing more than a promise. It wasn't based on anything. Today, what happens uh, is government policies, especially since uh, a COVID, uh, have adopted a, uh, actually, sorry, not since COVID, since the 2008 uh, uh, mortgage lending crisis, uh, the last kind of major uh, economic crisis that hit our world, was that governments around the world, and not only the United States, but others, started a policy known as quantitative quantitative easing, which is essentially, uh, you know, the, the Federal Reserve began using this policy. Um, and so, for example, between 2007 and 2017, the Fed's assets increased from $882 billion to $4.4 trillion. Uh, after what happened in COVID, uh, you know, this, this policy of, a lot, a lot of times people refer to it as printing money. Obviously, it's not just printing money. Oy, today, the vast majority of money in circulation is digital, right? So it's not just, uh, it's not just printing money, but it's, it's, it's this digital creation of money. And it's gone up from eight, up to 8.5 trillion. So we've gone from 800 billion in 2007 to 8.5 trillion, essentially because governments are debasing the currency by putting more money into circulation. Um, and it's not just the government uh, that does that. It's also private bank loans. Every time a bank uh, lends out money uh, to new lenders, they're essentially creating this money uh, out of thin air because not only do they not have that money in their reserves, but they're also expecting, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're going to lend a 10-year loan at 10% interest, you're expecting that interest uh, it's to, to, to be paid. So essentially creating more money through future interest payments. Um, so what we have is we have a uh, th this combination of of government monetary policy, private lending through banks and other financial institutions that is essentially doing the same thing as what happens here in Rome. That they're we're printing more and more money. We're 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 debasing our currency, and this, as you can see, you know this timeline here uh, is over two hundred years, right? So over two hundred years, the value of of the national currency that circulated in Rome essentially plummeted to nothing. Uh, this policy that might have started back in the 70s uh, and especially uh, accelerated since 2007, 2008, you know, are we following a similar path? Is our currency essentially going to become uh, useless? Um, and then one other issue is the, the issue of debt, right? So uh, Nate Hagens, who's a, a thinker, uh, 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 an economist that I've mentioned uh, several times in, in other classes, says that all of the money in the world, when it is spent, will be spent on something requiring energy. This means that money is a claim on energy and debt is a claim on future energy. We don't have the amount of energy at low enough cost to pay back all of the existing financial claims. So this 
$8.5 trillion worth of quantitative easing, of money that has been created out of thin air by government policy, by private bank loans, uh, is debt. And for that money to be to to come into existence, it has to be through something. So so economic growth is based on extracting resources. It's based on finding new sources of, of, of energy, fossil fuel, nuclear, renewables, whatever it might be. Um, so the idea is that, you know, this issue of debt, there might come a time when simply we can't pay it back, right? It's it, it, it's there's not going to be enough for it. And that's what happens when inflationary policies, like in the case of, of Rome, essentially create uh, a collapse ceremony scenario. People find out that money is worth nothing. The national currency, which is where all of our savings are at, essentially becomes nothing, right? And the debt that we owe uh, collectively and to ourselves, you know, is is unable to be paid back. Um, so yeah, I guess the question is, this is a real issue. This is something that I think that that is kind of under the radar of a lot of people. Um, and it, we might think, well, what does this have to do with community development? Well, obviously, you know, in every rural community, in every marginalized community, when, you know, if the the, the minuscule amount of savings that a community has, if that starts to disappear, starts to diminish, starts to devalue, you know, that is going to create an enormous amount of poverty, enormous amount of suffering of, 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 of economic scarcity, right? So how can local communities how can people who work in the in the community development sector understand that this issue of of government policy creating inflation you know how can we respond to that to create more autonomy more resiliency with the communities where we work um and so here here's a few more quote, quotes from an austrian economist he was one of the uh ludwig von mises was his name he was a uh, uh died back in the 1960s but he was one of the first ones that really spoke about uh, you know, the problem with government inflation and, and the whole process of governments creating money. Uh, he, was one of, he had kind of this radical view that, mon that the creation of monetary resources as a means of exchange should not be in the hands of government, but should be in the hands of community. Uh, and this was a, a, a mainstream economist. He worked for the Austrian government. He wasn't a radical Marxist or anything like that. He was someone that said, look, it doesn't make sense that governments have the ability to create money. And so here's a few quotes from uh, one of his books. It says, when a government or a banking elite, uh, remember, we, you know, the, the policy of, of inflation come both from the private and the public sector, claims the right to expand the supply of money without limits it plays with the fire that can quickly spiral out of control and end in economic ruin and even outright societal collapse. The only way to protect against the dangers of a policy of monetary inflation is for the control of money to be taken out of the hands of government and central banks. That's a pretty revolutionary claim. The interactions of people, voluntary exchanged on the market, must beget forms of money which are widely used and which cannot be manipulated by any man or institution. For example, ma manipulation such as uh, quantitative even easing policies, the government creating money out of thin air, private banks creating money through, through, through high interest loans. Um, and lastly, through a long evolution, governments or certain groups of governments have promoted the idea that money is not simply a market phenomenon, but that it is whatever the government calls money. So if the Fed, Federal Reserve of the United States suddenly says, you know, with this, uh, for example, during COVID, we're, we're, we're having an economic downturn because of all of the, the closures of society that this pandemic enforced. So to re-stimulate the economy, what we're going to do is inject a couple trillion dollars into the economy. Where did that money come from? From touching some buttons on a screen, right? From creating it digitally. Um, so if that's what the government calls money, but money is not what the government says, says von Mises. Money is the generally accepted and generally used medium of exchange by a community, by a group of people. It is something. It is not something created by government. It is something created by the people buying and selling on the market, right? So this is where we're going to make the transition into local currencies. If if we take that what von Mises says to be true, that money is not what the government says it is, it's what people use to buy and sell in the market, right? So if I'm a local farmer and I bring a, a bunch of vegetables into, into town um, and I'm looking for someone to cut my hair because I need a haircut, you know, without money, what happens? I have to go uh, to every barber in town and ask them if they would like to barter uh, some vegetables for a haircut, right? 
um in barter you know do, does have a place i think in local uh, local economies and in community development programs barter can be a, a useful tool but it's also <laughs> it's also difficult to think that every time we want to have some sort of economic exchange between two willing parties it has to be direct so money is essentially you know a, a, a local source of value that makes it easier to exchange things right so what is a local currency and how is it different from a national currency um, we're gonna. I'm gonna be following the work of David Fleming. Uh, he's an author. Uh, died recently from the United Kingdom, and he wrote a lot uh, about local currencies and how they can be an extremely empowering tool uh, for local com communities who want to uh, kind of maintain their autonomy and their resiliency. Uh, and so he says, this is his definition: a local currency is a form of money, other than the national currency, set up and managed locally. So there's always going to be geographic limits, right? You're not going to be able to, uh, you know, if, uh, I'm not going to be able to use a local currency printed in this part of the country on the other side of the country or in another, uh, you know, another state. Um, the reason for establishing a local currency at present is that it enables local producers handicapped by high costs and, and extreme competition to compete more effectively with efficient national and international producers. The, the intention is to give them a better chance of making a living, providing a needed local service, and staying in business. So this is where local currencies, local currencies, I think, have the ability to protect local communities from these inflationary policies um, as, you know, a, a, a very real and serious kind of threat of societal collapse. You know, if, if, if local, if people have their, their savings, uh, you know, tied up in a local currency instead of in a national currency, it's essentially a buffer, a way to protect them from these inflationary policies. At the same time, as Fleming is saying here, local currencies have the ability to be empowering to local communities by allowing people to trade, uh, locally, uh, and, and, and to sell locally by also limiting competition from outside, uh, you know, outside and globalized interests. So here's an example. Here in El Salvador, uh, there's a lot of people who grow corn. Uh, corn is kind of the traditional uh, uh, a crop. Uh, we eat corn tortillas, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with every, uh, with every meal. But over the past 20 years, especially starting in 2003, uh, Central America as a region signed a a free trade agreement with the United States and Canada. And one of the things that happened was that the United States uh, uh, and all of their corn producers were able to find a new market for their corn. And so in the United States, you know, people don't grow a couple acres of corn. They don't grow it by, by hand, you know, using hand tools here. Corn is grown by small farmers who might be growing an acre of corn. They use a hoe. Um, there's very limited, uh, you know, you know, types of, uh, uh, chemical resources that are used, whereas corn in the United States is grown in the scale of 10,000, 20,000 acres using massive combines, huge machines, enormous amounts of, of chemicals. And so what happened is obviously given that competitive advantage, given the fact that the United States government also spends billions of dollars of subsidies, essentially paying for this type of production, producers of corn, you know, large farmers in the United States are able to produce corn, uh, you know, much cheaper. Obviously, it's not as healthy. It's has all of these chemical residues on it. But what happened was when we signed the free trade agreement, Salvadoran farmers essentially were unable to find a way to sell their corn locally. Uh, and what's happened over the last 20 years is that people no longer grow corn. There might be some small subsistence farmers that grow for themselves, uh, but we purchase our corn from the United States now. Uh, and so a local currency is a way of saying, a community is saying, look, we don't want to eat GMO corn that has residues of glyphosate and other herbicides and other cancer causing chemicals. We want to support our local farmers. How can we do that? So when if if local people can only purchase corn using a local currency, um, then they're not going to be able to go to the, the, the market in San Salvador and buy corn that was imported from the United States. By using a local currency, and it obliges local people to find local farmers. And then that local farmer can use that local currency uh, to stay in business. It's a way for them to compete uh, with the globalized economy, which is always oriented against the interest of the small producer, right? Uh, and so local currency is a way of protecting small-scale farmers, of enforcing uh, or, or encouraging. I, I, I guess I don't think it's a forcing because nobody 
you know, in, in most cases with local currencies today, you can choose to use, you know, either one. But people who choose to use it, it's, an, it's, it's a way of encouraging them to support the local economy. Uh, why should we use local currencies? So currencies that are explicitly matched to the economies that they serve, to the localities, to the local geographies, are an extremely powerful instrument. They have the ability to sustain a business life which would otherwise sink into unemployment and exclusion due to the competitive global economy, right? So that's where that's what we're speaking about. Um, that because of you know this this massive opening of the world through globalization, uh, you know, what happens today is that whatever can be produced cheapest uh is going to be produced cheapest and flooded into the market. That's why every time that we go to the local to our supermarket, right, we're gonna find food that comes from every corner of the world. And it, it's it, it almost seems illogical, right? That you know the corn that is produced thousands of miles away in the United States can be cheap cheaper than the corn produced by my local farmer. But that's the economy of scale. That's the economy uh, of globalization, right? Um, but the idea that that also extracts wealth from a community, right? So every time that, you know, I purchase corn from that that's imported from the United States, that money gets sucked away from my community. If I were to spend a little bit more purchasing with uh, a local farmer, then I can, uh, then I can ensure that, that that money stays with him. But if I, instead of just buying the money from him, if I buy the corn from him using a local currency, well, then that money that I spend to buy corn and make my own tortillas, well, then now he has that money. But that money, instead, you know, he could if if I had bought that in the in the national currency, he could then go to the local supermarket and buy Coca Cola or or whatever it might be. And again, that money is extracted. But by using local currency, he then has to find a way to use that money locally as well. And as that money circulates throughout that community, it empowers, uh, you know, it, it empowers the local economy. It creates more wealth. It creates more longer lasting value creation. Um, so yeah, local currencies keep money cir circulating for longer periods of time in local geographies. And the more that money circulates in place, the stronger the economy is going to become, the more resilient it's going to become. So I want to talk about uh, three, two different types uh, of local currencies because, uh, you know, obviously local currencies are created in specific geographical regions. And every community that comes together to decide on, on on how they're going to create a local currency is going to be based on 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 the the conditions, the context, the specifics of their locality. Um, you know what we said, what Ludwig von Mises says is that money uh, is something created by people buying and selling on the market. So there is no you know one theory about how uh, we all have to go about uh, creating local economies. You know it can be different. It's going to be different. And so here we're going to look at a couple examples. So. Uh, one of the most famous uh, examples of local currencies, um, one that's gotten a lot of attention, is called the LETS system, L-E-T-S, uh, and that stands for, let me get that back open, sorry. That's the, it, LETS stands for Local Exchange Trading Schemes. Uh, and so let's are local networks of people. Uh, it's not necessarily everybody in a community, everybody in a town, but it's local networks of people uh, who want to supply services amongst each other in return for credits that are then held in an account in a central computer managed by the scheme's volunteer accountant. So, for example, this is essentially a multiple barter system. It's where buyers and sellers don't have to necessarily find someone who wants exactly what they have. The example is if I go into town with my vegetables and I want a haircut, I have to find a barber. No, it's not that. Uh, so what it is, is that if I want a haircut and all I have to offer some bread, I don't need to find someone looking precisely for that trade. Instead, members of a let scheme provide the goods and services and they get a credit. Uh, sometimes that credit is in the form of a, of a printed money. Uh, sometimes a lot of times, a lot of these, uh, let systems, uh, that are being implemented in different towns around the world, uh, are, are digital these days. So it's essentially, you get a credit on, uh, on an app. On your smartphone, uh, and then that credit can then be used, uh, you know, somewhere else. So, for example, here look at the uh, uh, look at the uh, the example over here. So, it's a group of people. Let's say we have fifty people. Uh, one person is a gardener. It's a person who likes gardening, who has a lot of experience, and he offers his or her gardening uh, gardening uh, services. Another person is a baker, and you know, if if, if they're they're willing to bake cakes or breads or whatever it might be. 
other person has a car, they might be, uh, you know, the service that they might offer is more uh, like kind of, uh, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the ride share service. Another person might have computer skills about fixing computers. Another person uh, might produce uh, certain vegetables for sale. Another person might uh, be willing to take care of your animals while you're away on vacation. Another person might be a seamstress and be able to. So the idea is that the, the, the wider amount of skills that people have, the more benefit it has. So in this group, we have about eight or 10 people. So let's say Dave here uh, wants to buy a cake for his wife for her birthday. So he goes uh, and he, uh, he purchases that um, from Sarah. So Sarah gets a uh, gets a credit that she can then use for any of the other, these other services. It's the idea of, of, of essentially uh, a wider barter system that uses uh, some source uh, uh, of accounting system that allows people. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, how, how, how do you uh, create, you know, is it the same amount of value a cake as a gardening service? And one of the things that's interesting is, is a lot of times the value that's, that's offered each thing is negotiated uh, on a personal basis, right? So it's kind of like, well, how many hours am I going to garden for you? Uh, how big is the cake going to be? Uh, and, and, and people come to, to these terms about how to determine what the value is for the service that they offer. Um, so that's one example. Um, the other, uh, another really interesting uh, option was, in, in, uh, it's called time banking or hours banking. Uh, and one of the most famous examples of this uh, came from uh, a small town in uh, New York called Ithaca, New York. Uh, and a community came together and they created their own currency, which you see here in this picture, uh, which were called the Ithaca Hours. That's what it was. And it's essentially as a banknote. They printed their own banknotes, their own uh, uh, paper currency. Uh, but it didn't have a monetary value. It had an hour value. So, it, you know, the, the the notes were denominated as two hours of work, one hour of work, half hour of work, quarter, quarter. eighth, etc. Uh, and each hour was pegged to essentially what uh, the minimum wage or or a fair wage for an hour of work was. This started back in the 1990s. Uh, when uh, in the United States, I think the, the minimum wage was like around four, three or four dollars an hour. Uh, and they, uh, you know, considered that each hour was going to be worth ten dollars. So it was pegged, it was pegged to, to the national currency. Uh, but one hour of work was equivalent to any other hour of work. And this was interesting. This is one of the strategy, one of the reasons for creating this type of currency uh, was to try and help people or high, try to fight against this idea uh, that certain work is more valuable than other work. Uh, essentially, trying to combat you know the, the mass amount of the inequality. So you know you know on the the global marketplace, uh, a local doctor can charge three hundred dollars an hour uh, for a short term uh, consult, whereas a person who's going to come and clean out your sewer system might only charge you know ten dollars an hour. Uh, or whatever it might be. And so what they're saying is that, you know, the, the services that a doctor uh, offer are certainly important, but the services that a septic cleaner uh, are just as important, right? You you can't live without either, either of them. So the idea is that let's let's create a, a, a value system that appreciates the value of work in itself. And so what is it, you know, somebody did work for somebody uh, and you get paid in the amount of time that you spent. And then you can take that and you can go to somebody else. So if you need uh, one of the things that was interesting about that was that almost the entire town began to participate, especially during the early years. And there were over 110,000 uh, Ithaca hours in circulation uh, at uh, you know at the height of this. Uh, and one of the things that's this was a small town, a couple thousand people. So there was an enormous amount of money that was circulating through uh, th this local currency of Ithaca hours. Um, what are some of the challenges? I think I think that's important to mention here. I'm, I'm going to try and finish up here. It's, we got about five minutes left before we go to the questions. But what are some of the challenges associated with local currencies? One uh, is that local currencies alone rarely succeed in providing the decisive protection needed by small scale inefficient producers, and that's because there's the Walmart ethic, right? So if I th uh, this is a, a a picture of co of coffee, right? I, I I have a small coffee farm. And if I was going to try and sell my coffee at two dollars and eighty eight cents, uh, a a for a pound or whatever it might be, a kilo of coffee, 
uh, I, I wouldn't make it, right? That wouldn't be be there. But, you know, on the global marketplace, there's always going to be people who are able to flood the market with, with cheaper prices because they have a comparative advantage, because they work for less, because of inequality, because of, uh, you know, all of these different horrible issues with exploitation of workers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, you know, when local currencies are forced to compete with national currencies that allow for this flooding of marketplace with cheap corn from the United States, cheap coffee from Vietnam, whatever it might be, there's always going to be people who are tempted to pay less, right? And that's the Walmart temptation. So in the global society we live in, for local currencies to really work, you need to have a community. And that's where we talked about the sense of community coherency. We have to have a group of people who believe in one another, who want this idea that currencies, that local currencies are a way to bind people together, right? That there's more important things than 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 just finding a bargain. There's more important things than just trying to find the cheapest thing you could find on the market, right? And so for currency, for local currencies to really compete, you have to have a sense of community uh, coherency. The other thing is going back to what we were speaking about at the beginning, this, this threat of societal collapse from uh, inflationary policies is that in a future scenario of inflationary collapse, we may be forced to move on from this Walmart ethic. You know, it, 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 when, when money becomes invaluable because of these inflationary policies, then we're not going to be able to buy coffee for 288 or corn for 10 cents uh, a pound or whatever it might be. So when this, if this does happen, uh, then what we're going to see is that small scale economies that build in inefficiencies uh, are, are going to be the only thing that exists, right? And if communities that have adopted these policies of of creating their own local currencies are going to be much more resilient, they're going to be less vulnerable, they're going to be more prepared to <coughs> continue uh, you know, the market exchange using currency that 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 has already been established, that is trusted, et cetera. And one of the best examples of this is Argentina. Back in 2001, uh, Argentina had a, a, a spectacular economic collapse. Inflation rose 5,000% over a year and a half or so. And essentially money became the, the, the peso argentino, which was the, the national currency, became invaluable. You, I mean, it, it, it was more valuable to burn the currency to keep your house warm uh, than to try and sell it. There was more value in that is what they said. Uh, but around that time, when this was happening, um, a lot of local communities came together and started creating local currencies. Uh, so when money is short, barter has advantages. When money becomes worthless, local local currencies are going to be are are, are going to be much more preferable uh, to national currencies. And one of the reasons that Argentina was able to pull through uh, this economic crisis was because there was thousands of communities around the country that began creating their own local currencies. People no longer, when you went to market, people didn't want uh, the national currency, the peso, because it was worthless. It didn't have anything. It was 5,000% inflation. And so people said, well, if you want to buy something that I have, you know, a local farmer went into town. If you want to buy the vegetables or the bread that I'm selling, you have to pay me something else. And so at first it was, you know, direct barter might have started. Then there were these local currencies that started. And local communities essentially were able to buffer themselves from this economic explosion, this, this collapse of, of the Argentinian economy, right? Uh, and there was also a, a national group uh, called the Regional Self-Sufficiency Program that helped uh, uh, that helped these communities uh, adopt, you know, the best strategies for creating their own local currencies. So under conditions of hyperinflation, local currencies shift up a gear to being a necessity. It's not that they're just going to be helpful, that it's a good way to keep uh, money in, in the community. No, it's going to become a necessity. And if the wider economy is not functioning, for example, like what happened in, in Argentina, then there is no alternative to buying local producers and services. You're going to have to use something else, right? If the market economy fails, if local currencies are no longer worth anything, living standards are going to fall. In some inefficiently produced high cost local goods uh, that are protected by local currency, and that's going to become a lifesaver for communities, right? That's going to be something that's that's really important in the future. Um, I want to end real quick by just sharing uh, one quick example uh, of uh, a local currency and, and, and some of the benefits that it creates. Artist Aurel de Saint-André met his wife Molly, also an artist, when both worked at an NGO in Afghanistan. She'd gone to school at Simons Rock College in Great Barrington, 
where they've now set up their graphic design firm. We try to combine this like very manual technique with like also computer um, medium, which is nice. We mostly work for local um, businesses around the Berkshires. We print for them, we make custom apparel, we do logos, and then we also have our own line of things that we sell mostly locally as well. Um, so there's an artist market um, that goes hand in hand with the farmer's market and um, we sell our work there. So like the posters um, are something that we've designed for our own line, um, but then we also do posters for other people as well. Is the existence of Berkshires important or even crucial to your business? We come because of the Berkshires. That's <laughs> uh, the trick. We love the idea of the Berkshire, and we really love supporting it by taking it from people, going to the bank and getting Berkshires. And that's Norman Rockwell? Yes. The bills commemorate local notables. Norman Rockwell on the 50. That's Melville. Author Herman Melville on the 20. Nearby Mount Greylock is said to have inspired Moby Dick. And civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois, who grew up a few miles away, is on the five. We are a business that survives only because people are willing to do things locally and are willing to pay slightly more to us probably than they would if they went online and contacted somebody to do the same work. I mean, you can get t-shirts printed online, you can get posters printed. So I think the idea behind the Berkshires is an idea that is very central to why we exist. And you want everybody to continue to be aware of that and focus on the need to support the community. Absolutely. One of the most important things about the Berkshires for us is that continuous reminder, is that visual reminder every time you open your wallet that you can spend this money locally and you can make the decision to do that. And that is underlying in our own business and very important to us that other people think of that and do that for us. So we would like to do that for other people as well.